um, assessment clinic, which is just set up in uh, Derbyshire. Thank you. So Chris is kindly going to share the, the slides. So our presentation will just give you an overview. Have you got the agenda, Chris? Can you see it or not? Yes, we can see the first slide. So next slide, introduction. I'm I'm That's on the agenda. Can you not see the agenda? Agenda's yeah. just appeared. Thank you. <laughs> OK, so our presentation will give you an overview of what post COVID syndrome is, why it's important and also what services we've developed uh, for patients in Derbyshire that are suffering from the post COVID syndrome. And of course, at the end, we'll have time for some questions, which um, I know some of you have already fed some of those in. But if you use a chat function as well, that'd be great. If we go to the next slide. Chris, thank you. So over the last year, research scientists across the world have been doing an incredible amount of work. They've produced the vaccines, um, they've produced treatments for patients that have, have been admitted to hospital. Um, they've also looked at what the disease is, the symptoms, the signs, and this research has been reviewed by um, several bodies, first one being NICE, which you may have heard of, which is the National Institute for Healthcare Excellence, and also the Squ Scottish equivalent, which is SIGN. Um, and they've defined what post-COVID is. So ongoing symptomatic COVID-19 is symptoms and signs that are ongoing from four to 12 weeks. And post-COVID syndrome signs and symptoms that develop during or after an infection which are consistent with COVID-19 and they continue for more than 12 weeks and are not explained by an alternative diagnosis. Go to the next slide, Chris. Are you seeing the next slide, yes. Cass? Thank you. Yeah, that's appeared. Thank you. So it's worth remembering that this virus is a, a new virus. A year ago, many of us had not heard of it. So there's a lot of emerging evidence around the symptoms, the signs, the treatment. This shows the list of symptoms that currently appear in the post-COVID syndrome list. So respiratory, which is lungs, breathlessness, cough, which you're probably aware of, cardiovascular, which is the heart, so chest tightness, pain, palpitations, generalised symptoms, fatigue, tiredness, fever and pain, neurological, which is the, the nervous system, so brain fog, loss of concentration, memory issues, headache, um, pins and needles, dizziness, um, confusion, Gastrointestinal, which is abdominal, tummy pains, nausea, diarrhea, musculoskeletal, which is joint pains and, and muscle pains, and then the psychiatric, um, psychological, which is depression, anxiety. It's probably also worth mentioning that um, along with the, the illness, obviously some patients that have been particularly admitted to hospital, to ITU, have the effects of, of that um, situation. So a lot of evidence about post-traumatic stress disorder with patients that have been discharged from ITU, which is independent to the disease process. So it's quite a complex picture of symptoms and signs that, that we're seeing. If you move on to the next slide, Chris, thank you. So post-COVID syndrome prevalence. So that's the number of individuals with the disease at any one time. And the table shows the cases across Derbyshire um, broken down, as you can see. Headline is that we've got so far 60,000 testing positive. Now, this was through a survey that the ONS completed in December. And it showed that 
of those testing positive, one in 10, so 10% were showing signs, symptoms for a period of 12 weeks or longer. So for Derbyshire at the moment, that equates to just under 6,000 patients. Now, the numbers are changing daily. It doesn't include patients that didn't have a positive test. So at the beginning of the pandemic, um, testing was not widespread. So there were patients and you probably know of people that had COVID symptoms that did not have access to a test. There's also the other complexity, which is that one in three people that have COVID don't display symptoms. So again, the numbers that we've got are based on positive tests, but there's some complexities to that, which is always worth remembering. So I'll pass it over to Chris, who's going to talk about the services. Thank you. Apologies for the delay, I got muted then, but I'm just going to uh, share again the screen for you and continue where we left off. OK. Mr Chet, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Apologies for the technical difficulties. So um, just to talk about the post COVID syndrome or long COVID, you can use either name assessment clinic that we've set up. So in November 2020, it was recognised right across the country that we've got a lot of people suffering the after effects of COVID. And so NHS England asked every area in the country, including Derbyshire, to bring together all the professionals that are needed to help these people with these symptoms and to make sure that we assess every part of the problem, the physical problems, the cognitive or memory problems, and a psychological assessment where needed to those people with post-COVID syndrome. Now, normally, setting up a service like this takes up about, takes about six to 12 months, but we had to do it in a month. And amazingly, this happened, and we launched the service in December 2020. And this was because all of the different health service agencies across Derbyshire worked together better than I think I have ever seen them work before. So there was the team at the uh, clinical Derby and Derbyshire Clinical Commissioning Group that Kath and I work with. Uh, we had we worked with professionals from the major hospitals in Derby and Chesterfield, with Derbyshire Community Health Services, who Becky Steed works for and the Mental Health Trust. And all of us were meeting together. There were meetings pretty much every day. And we set up this service which provides patients with all the advice they need in one place. So once they've been referred uh, to Becky and her team, they can then have onward referral wherever's needed to rehabilitation, which is things like physio or occupational therapy, to psychological support, to specialist investigation or treatment, whatever they need, they can then be referred on to with one referral. And um, this is a changing and evolving service, but we're very happy to describe what's happening at the moment. And uh, the service accepts referrals from GPs um, with complex needs. So um, we'll, we'll come back in a moment to other options, but there are other options if someone's only got joint pain, for example, they might purely need a physio. But if people need, um, have got symptoms of tiredness, perhaps and joint pains and psychological problems, then that's the, the sort of people that this assessment clinic really helps. Um, because of COVID, the, we're doing all appointments by telephone to start with. But if somebody needs a face to face appointment, um, then that will be sorted for them. So this looks complicated, but I'll go through step by step. If you look on the left hand side, you can see um, that the patient to start with will need a clinical review if they've got ongoing symptoms. And um, we do GP investigation in primary care. So myself um, as a GP, I would uh, listen to the patient's story, uh, hear what their problems are, and then examine them if need be, and then think about what tests might be needed. These are usually things like blood tests or ECGs that can be done at our surgery or a chest X-ray, which can be done at the local hospital if needed. 
Um, but you'll see at the bottom on the left, also secondary care, which means uh, the big hospitals, um, they, after someone's discharged, usually phone them four to six weeks later. And if they're picking up that they've got ongoing problems, um, they can also refer into the service. And then, as you'll see, the arrows talk about mild, moderate, severe and severe symptoms. So I'll cover mild symptoms first. If someone's got mild symptoms, then I usually direct them to the Your COVID Recovery website. Now, if any of you have not seen this, if you search for that in your search engine, uh, you'll find it's excellent. It's got self-care advice and various other voluntary sector services can be involved. Um, but you can click on any symptom that you or a family or friend have got and it gives you some really good advice. And actually, only this week I had two people that I thought needed to be referred to Becky in the long COVID clinic. But actually, I gave them the advice from the website and they've got better. So um, that, that's been really good to see. Um, there's also um, and then so that's the mild symptoms. If we move down to moderate or severe symptoms, those are the people or complex symptoms that we want to refer to the post COVID syndrome assessment clinic. And um, the box on the right, I'll let Becky cover in a moment, because those are all the different people that Becky can then refer people to. And then right at the bottom, we've got severe symptoms. Um, this clinic is not for people having a life threatening emergency. Um, if someone's having you know, urgent chest pain or significant shortness of breath with low oxygen levels or a mental health crisis, then obviously they need to be referred um, straight away. But I'll hand over to Becky Steed now, who's the lead GP for the post-COVID clinic, to tell you a little bit more. Thanks, Chris. Um, so we've got the that middle box that was on the previous slide. We've just expanded out to just explain a little bit more detail about what happens once people come through to the clinic. So once the referral comes through, we get a really good amount of detail from the GP. We also have ask for for patients to provide a questionnaire where they explain and also score their symptoms just to make sure that we're not missing anything because especially when somebody's got a long and complex history of illness it can be really difficult for them to try and explain it all um, in one go so actually giving them the form to go through it they're in their own time write down what's been happening get the support from somebody else if they need to to fill that out and then we've got that to look at with the information that the GP's passed on as well. So one of our clinicians will go through all of that paperwork and create a summary. Somebody's start writing basically their COVID story. We'll then, um, within that assessment clinic, speak to the person um, themselves and just hear in their own words what's the most important things to them. What are the things that are troubling them the most? What are their priorities for us to try to help with? What's going to make the biggest difference to them? Once we've done that assessment, we talk through, while we're still um, doing the assessment process, talk through with the person what we think might need to happen next and that depends on what they've come with because long covid is an incredibly diverse illness it's incredibly diverse syndrome and it affects people in incredibly different ways so there's no standardized approach what we've got is options so one of the options is if there's some medical complexities if if things we're just not quite sure do they need some more specialist tests do they need to go and see people at the hospital then we'll, re we'll go to the medical team meeting where some of these specialist consultants meet with us we talk through the case and we work out what might need to be done and if they need to be referred on then we refer them on to the um, appropriate specialist if they think that no we, we're happy that there's nothing extra going on but there's clearly a lot of things that need support from a therapy and rehabilitation point of view then we take them to the therapy multidisciplinary team meeting that's what the MDT stands for on the on the pictures so at that um, at that meeting we've got physiotherapists both from respiratory so from the chest um, physiotherapy uh, background we've got physiotherapists from the musculoskeletal, from the um, muscles and joints teams. We've got occupational therapists who um, are used to working with people with um, complex needs to try to rehabilitate them, particularly working with people with fatigue in something called, that's called pacing, which helps um, quite a lot in, in this syndrome. We also have people from health psychology and also from um, for memory assessment for some of the cognitive difficulties from, with some of their memory and um, concentration difficulties. So we talk together as a team about the difficulties that somebody's got and we work out what might be the best service to meet that person's needs. And sometimes that's 
an extra service that isn't represented at the meeting. Sometimes it's one of the people will put their hand up and go, yeah, I think this is exactly the right person for my service um, and this is how we can move things forwards. So we make a plan and then we go back to the person and explain what the plan is and talk about any questions that they've got and then they get referred on. So on the next slide, um, you can just see that we've got a variety of different services that we can refer out to. Um, so we've got um, community and rehabilitation services, all of those specialities that I've just mentioned. We've got the mental health um, teams um, and also the health psychology if we need something more specific. Um, we've also got access into social care if we need to, to signpost people to carer support, for example, um, or Citizens Advice Bureau. Um, so we've got a real wide range of things that we can we can refer people into. Um, and I'll go I'll come back in a few minutes because the other thing that we can refer into is the your COVID recovery um, site. So we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Just wanted to give an overview of the service so far. We've only been live since the end of December, so we are a very new service. So we've had 65 people through um, about a third of Derbyshire practices have currently referred. So we're already starting to starting to, to, to catch and absorb some of that, that need. We're doing we're doing the assessments and obviously some people from the assessment, it's really apparent what they need. So we don't wait, make them wait for a, a meeting. We can refer them straight on. So you can see on the on the figures that there are some that we've directly referred that it's really clear what they need. So we've just directly referred them to the, the appropriate place. Um, you can see that almost half of the people have been sent through to the multidisciplinary team um, because that's, that is the most widely used thing just for us to make sure that we're, um, we're meeting the right needs. The 26% at the bottom that says other, those are the people that we've um, we've worked out that probably need to be, would get their needs best met by your COVID recovery. So that's something that we're explaining on the next slide. Um, your COVID recovery is, um, as my colleagues mentioned earlier, is a national digital platform and it's been set up to support patients recovering at home. It's hosted by the University of Leicester. There are two sides to it now. It's, it's constantly developing and evolving. The first side of it is something which I would recommend to anybody. So I think anybody on this call who's obviously got an interest in, in um, post-COVID syndrome, I think it's worth, um, worth having a look. It's got a lot of really good information about physical, emotional and psychological well-being on it. It's got information for families and carers as well as for patients themselves. Um, and there's also a lot of uh, really good links to signpost to other organisations. There's a lot of support out there, but a lot of people don't know how to find it. So it's it's been put really as a way of helping people to signpost to, the, to extra and, and even um, support that they may not be otherwise aware of. The other element to the website is um, an interactive digital rehabilitation platform. So that's called phase two. That is currently um, password protected and you have to be assessed by a clinician before you go on to it. And our service are just going through the process to mean that we can refer people on. So we've got a waiting list of people who are um, who are appropriate. So as soon as we get onto the um, onto the site we'll be able to start onboarding people onto that and supporting people through their rehabilitation in a virtual way and that can work for some people but clearly not for everybody so we've um, that's one of the options in our toolbox so to speak. Right, thank you for that. So, Chris, if I could go to you first. We've had a question in from Anne. Uh, I've put it in the chat box. She wanted to ask if someone contacted uh, contracted COVID-19 in March or April last year before community testing began, but were not ill enough to be hospitalised, so never got a formal diagnosis, but they're still finding now that they have symptoms which would be indicative of long COVID. Are they eligible to attend the long COVID clinic? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Thank you, Anne, for that one. Um, yes, um, because actually we probably all know people who, who got 
COVID at the very beginning of, of the pandemic and are still affected by it. I know several doctors in that position. Uh, so yes, we don't want to uh, not give them the care they want just because they haven't got a post positive COVID test. So if um, somebody like that has got significant ongoing symptoms and they've looked at the long COVID, uh, the Your COVID Recovery website, and that's not sufficient for them, then we would encourage them to speak to their GP. And if I as a GP was speaking to somebody like perhaps your friend, um, I'd want them to tell their story really of what their illness was like at the beginning and what their symptoms are now. Um, and then usually you can tell, is this likely to be post-COVID syndrome or not? And certain features like if they lost their sense of taste and smell during the initial illness, make it almost 100% likely it was COVID. And even if they didn't, if they've got ongoing symptoms which are typical of long COVID, like the tiredness and the shortness of breath and so forth, that they didn't have before, then and, and those are ongoing, then that's the sort of person that I would want to refer to Becky and her team um, in the clinic. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for answer, asking that question. And Kath, I think, did you yeah, want to could I just come in? Thanks, oh, yeah. Katie. So it's probably worth mentioning to everyone that at the moment there are no um, blood tests that a GP can organise to say whether you've had COVID or not, um, known as sort of antibody testings. Um, it is in research at the moment, so research is ongoing about the antibodies that people have after a COVID infection. Um, but that is still in development. So um, GPs will not be able to organise a test as it stands to, to sort of confirm or um, dispute whether you've had COVID. So it's probably worth just pointing that out. Thank you. OK, and then we've had another one. I, uh, Chris or Rebecca, you may want to take this from Peter, which says, can we determine whether people with long COVID are those individuals who presented with underlying health problems prior to COVID, or does it just sit across whole groups of people? And the second part is, will older people get more issues um, connected with mobility and digital exclusion and so not get the same benefit from the service you're offering and being able to access the website? OK, if we start with the first part of that question, I guess I would say that having having been assessing um, people in the clinic um, since we started, I can definitely say that it does not discriminate. Um, long COVID can affect absolutely everybody, anybody. So there are some people that do have um, long term conditions that have um, come along uh, uh, there alongside the um, long COVID. But there are many people that we're seeing that have never been ill for a day in their lives before. Um, so it, it does it just seems to be completely random. It's also not related to the severity of the COVID infection, the initial COVID infection. So there are some people who have very mi mild symptoms. Who, who have still got quite significant disability with long COVID now. And we've got people who were in ITU, intensive care for months, who are actually rehabilitating and, and getting better and, and don't have long COVID. So there's there's no real link with the how you were before you had COVID, and there's no real link on how you how severely and well you were at the initial infection time. Long COVID can still happen. So it can happen to anybody. Um, and we really just want to make sure that we assess people as a whole human being, understanding what they were like before and what they are like now, so that we've got some sort of a comparison that we can make. Because obviously somebody who may have been already disabled in some way by a long term condition will rehabilitate differently to somebody who was previously completely fit and well. So we, we just take the time to understand where where was somebody before they got COVID and where are they now? And how can we help to rebalance it and get, get things back in line? Thank you. And um, Kath, I don't know if you just wanted to see if you could pick up the little bit about accessing the web, you know, if you've got mo mobility issues about the clinic and accessing the w website in terms of digital exclusion. So there is a huge piece of work going on at the moment by Derbyshire Health Watch. Um, they've got a PPG 
of, of over 70 members looking at this whole issue of, of digital exclusion and that's not just related to this service it's related to all services in Derbyshire across uh, providers including primary care so it is an issue that's being looked at and addressed I think it's also worth noting that it's about giving patients choice um, so it's not about giving only digital options but giving choice and particularly if you think um, about access if a cohort of patients access things digitally it gives more room and access for other patients that may struggle whether that's using a, a phone or, or a digital option so it's about giving patients a choice I think and that's really important but there is a lot of work going on on that about digital exclusion because I think particularly with the COVID uh, situation how things have, have panned out for all of us um, we're aware that the digital transformation that's happened in all of our lives needs uh, you know carefully thinking of as we go forward. All right. Thank you very much. We've also had a question from Colin and it asks if someone was admitted twice last year, uh, November and December, with COVID-19 and pneumonia and from the list of symptoms and, and you referenced them earlier in the presentation, um, had around 10 of them. Is it possible to estimate what a recovery might look like in terms of weeks, months, years? Chris or um, Rebecca? Yeah, don't um, to yes. Um, well, I'm happy to start, and then Rebecca can can add, can add in. Yes, unfortunately, we we can't really predict. Partly because this is such a new illness, um, exactly how long it's going to take for somebody to recover. But I think what we are about is making sure that every patient gets the best care they can to make the best recovery they can as quickly as they can. And that's what, what Becky and her team are doing. Um, the, the data and the research is not out there yet to know exactly how long this, the, these symptoms are going to go on for because the disease only started just over a year ago. And what I would say, if people have got underlying health conditions, then the COVID symptoms can impact, they can impact on them. So again, if somebody's got COPD, we would, um, want them to be um, talking to their practice nurse about getting that the COPD under control because that's also going to help as well as yes if somebody's got 10 of the symptoms then we would certainly want to be referring to Becky and her team because that sounds really hard and really complex and they might need all sorts of different health professionals to support with each of those 10 symptoms I mean hopefully they won't need 10 health professionals involved but um, but they will they will need uh, Becky and her team anything you want to add to that Becky no, I, d I definitely say that that's that's a really good summary Chris because yeah but people people do usually have um, in terms of the ones that come through to our clinic I know that GPs in the community are probably seeing more of the people with one maybe two of the symptoms but one of the, the ones that come to our clinic you've usually got at least four and up to 10 or 11 um, symptoms off the list and that's where our assessment comes into its own because what we what we're trying to do is to make sure we understand all of it and somebody has that chance to tell their story but that also we've got that opportunity to prioritize the symptoms and work out what's going to make the most difference first and we've got time to then work on that thing and then we can work on the next part so we, we can get a step-by-step -step thing because if you think about somebody with 10 or 11 or 12 symptoms you can't you can just feel overwhelmed by that and not really know how you're going to ever get better whereas if you start to focus your mind on one or two things and think well okay if my breathing got a little bit better or if my fatigue improved that would make the first difference and then we can work on that and then we'll look at where we're at again and we'll we'll do the next step so it's doing it in breaking it down into bite-sized chunks so that yeah. it's it's possible and, and not overwhelming. That's lovely. Um, I may be going to the wrong person, Kath, but Stephen has asked, um, uh, as COVID yeah. is a Derbyshire-wide issue, why have only a third of GP practices been referred in? Thanks, uh, Katie. It's, it's quite a complex answer to this. So um, I suppose what we need to remember is that a lot of the patients that have been admitted have been on a discharge pathway so they might not necessarily have come through this service so those patients are being looked after in, in a 
um, perhaps a, a different pathway. I think the other thing to think about is that across Derbyshire, um, throughout this pandemic, there's been different pockets and, and prevalence as, as we've gone on. Um, so different areas have had, you know, different numbers of cases. Um, and I think that probably is reflected in, in the experience in, in general practice. The other side of that, and I think, you know, Becky and, and, and Chris as, as GPs as, as well will attest to the fact that um, because the evidence is emerging um, about what the symptoms are of COVID, and that's changed since the pandemic started, but also um, about post-COVID, it's a relatively new um, sort of diagnosis. So um, evidence is emerging, and I think the numbers are beginning um, to feed through. And I think there was a comment about the, the time from referral to assessment. Um, obviously, um, we're not sure that that will stay as impressive as it, as, as it is um, if the numbers increase as, as we expect. Um, I think the thing about the, the pathway and the number of GPs referring, we are going to review um, the service. It was put in place very rapidly um, over a month. So a lot of work's been done and set up, but we do need to review the service and get, you know, patient feedback um, in from, you know, right. patients and practices. And it was only set up in December, this service. So we're still early days. All right, thank you very thank much. You. Um, Bernard has said, is if anyone's presenting with an underlying chronic illness, for example, type one diabetes, are there any focused options available to support anxiety related issues? Becky, you might want to pick that up. I would say, did you have your hand up, Chris? Or? Oh, I was just trying to do a subtle wave. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris, for you. <laughs> I was obviously too subtle. <laughs> so yes, thank you. Thank you, Becky. So um, my other role, as well as with the post-COVID syndrome, is I'm lead for diabetes for Derby and Derbyshire CCD. So I thought, oh, I'll, I'd love to answer this one. So yeah, living with type 1 diabetes is, is time consuming and stressful and unrelenting at the best of times. So I can imagine if someone's got type 1 diabetes and post-COVID syndrome, that really makes life hard and and can cause anxiety. So for anybody with anxiety related issues, um, you can self refer. We have a number of uh, mental health options in Derbyshire. So anybody living in Derbyshire um, through their GP surgery can ask for the phone numbers for the, um, we call it um, IAPT, IAPT services. Um, and these are psychological counselling services. And some of them have only got a two or three week wait at the moment to get counselling. Um, if somebody wants immediate help, there's a Derbyshire mental health line open 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. And again, um, you can just Google Derbyshire mental health line and, and get the phone number for that. Um, with diabetes, I'm assuming anybody with type 1 diabetes um, certainly has a practice nurse. And most people with diabetes also um, have a specialist team that they can talk to and get support from. Um, Diabetes UK has a superb website and they have people uh, manning their phone line as well, um, giving support and advice and are really, really helpful. And also um, in Derbyshire, we have a really good access to the Daphne course. Um, and that course helps people to manage their own diabetes well. And there's even a, a Facebook group for people with type one diabetes in Derbyshire. I better stop there. I could talk all yeah. morning of the help and support there is for people with type one diabetes and anxiety. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to differentiate now. I'm just going to say, so either Rebecca or Chris, if someone had some of the symptoms prior to where we are now, and it was part of their day-to-day -day life, could the symptoms be misdiagnosed? Could 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 there be um, uh, Peter? I don't know if you want to unmute your microphone and and just ask the question. It's it's fine if you don't. I'm just reading it out from the chat box. Right. Okay. My take my read on that question is yep. is he's saying if somebody had symptoms like tiredness or shortness of breath. Um, before and they've always had that 
could that be quite confusing to diagnose whether it's post-COVID syndrome? And I think that's a really good question, Peter. And my feeling is, um, as, as Becky mentioned earlier, we want people to tell their story right from the beginning, really. What were they like before they got the illness that might have been COVID or was definitely COVID? And what are they like now? Because if actually they've always been equally short of breath, well, it's probably not post-COVID syndrome, we need to be looking at other causes. Or if they've always been tired, again, we need to look at other causes. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, my oh. um, mic was sort of like, for some reason, not working properly. For, oh, uh, it's all right, time. Peter. But yeah, okay. I, uh, thanks, Kirsten, for that, because it's something uh, from the beginning of this meeting I've come across, because I've dealt with Macmillan for, since 2004, for example, and different aspects within um, Health Watching Derby and one or two other NHS systems. And it's just something what's never really been brought up from my point of view. And I think deep down what needs to be done is ask the questions, fair enough, but can that be misdiagnosed from what somebody's telling you as, as absolutely GPs or practitioners, whichever way you want to look at it? Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you. Oh, that I'm makes sense to... anyway. <laughs> it, it does. Yeah. Thank ha you very much, Peter. Pleasure. Thank you. Katie, I'm just... sorry. Could yeah. I just add, add to that? Yeah, sorry, just to um, sort of add some other information. So as part of um, the work that we've done to set the clinic up, we had um, not just DCHS, who um, Becky works for the community services, but also from um, the trust Chesterfield and, and UHDB, the Derby Hospital, lots of clinicians and we put together um, a whole package of information to support GPs in that difficult sort of diagnosis about investigation and, and referral and, and to consider other, other possible causes. So there is a whole wealth of information there to support GPs, help patients um, in that diagnosis. So just to add that. Thanks, Kath. Uh, we've had a question from Catherine who's saying, are all GPs in Derbyshire aware of phase two of the COVID recovery programme? It was launched in July. Uh, they'd asked their GP to refer them in August and again in October, but the surgery wasn't aware. Is, has some work been done around marketing or, or communicating that out to all practices? I guess if I, if I start just with a bit of an explanation that the, the phase two um, isn't going to be something which GP practices are going to be referring into at this point because it needs ongoing input from the from a trained clinician and, and you often need a, a bit more of a therapy background to actually be able to support people through it because it's a therapy pathway which as, as GPs we haven't always got the expertise to deal with so all GPs should be aware of the Your COVID Recovery first stage open access where everybody can access information but it would be more specialised services like mine that can then refer people on to the um, rehabilitation platform because it does need more um, more input than than simply going on to it you do have to to keep reviewing and you do have to keep checking in with somebody how they're actually doing as they progress through the, the programme so you do really need some therapy input at that point which a, a gp isn't necessarily best placed to to give that's lovely rebecca thank you chris kath did you want to add anything or shall i move on so just to, to add, on? yes um so just to add for somebody that was thinking they'd like to be part of that phase two interactive digital platform they would need to speak to their gp and be referred to the, the service as a whole and then they would speak to becky or one of their colleagues and then be referred if it's appropriate Okay, thank you very much. Um, Bernard's asked, what is, uh, Kath, I don't know if you want to take this, what the approach is uh, where English is not the first language, if, if people are trying to access services? So, I'm just going to speak from a sort of primary care perspective. Um, we have language lines, so our practices, and we've got a heart a wide diversity of practices with diff different different uh, language needs ac across Derbyshire um, and practices having visited a, a lot of them in, in recent months are um, very attuned to that um, the receptionists and and the staff and there are in interpretation services available again when any GP does a referral to any provider not just this service we um, have to sort of 
make allowances for the language and whether an interpreter is needed. So hopefully um, that addresses the, the question from a broader Derbyshire perspective. And I don't know, Becky, if you've got anything to add on that. I'd, I'd just say that that, that is, that is um, very um, prominent information that comes through on our referral form. So any communication needs, so that can be English as a second language. Um, for some people, um, particularly if strongly affected by the, the brain symptoms of long COVID, actually we've had some referrals come through with a you need to speak to the person's partner because that person cannot communicate and retain enough information to have a a meaningful com conversation so we've had a, a couple of conversations with with partners present as well as um as well as the person affected to to try and get over that communication and, and memory issue as well so there's there's a whole myriad of, of potential issues that we are set up to get and the gps are being brilliant at at letting us know about that so we can be pre-warned and we can make sure that we make the right accommodations um, because it's it's vital that we get to hear the person's story in whatever language or whatever format works for them. Thank you very much and Stephen's asked how do you differentiate between ME and long Covid? If I go to Rebecca and Chris, I don't know if you want to. I guess that's that's a challenging challenging question I would say that for for our service if fatigue is the single symptom um, whether that that occurs after having had COVID or a different viral infection then the post viral fatigue pathway which already exists within Derbyshire is really well set up to meet that person's needs already so when we say it's more likely to be post-COVID syndrome and may need a different rehabilitation pathway is when you get the whole collection of symptoms um, of, of, of long COVID. So when you've got the respiratory symptoms, the breathing issues, you've got the fatigue, you've also got the pains, you've got the headaches, you've got the chest pain. All of a sudden you've got somebody with a, a very different collection of symptoms than, um, than the, the, the chronic fatigue, the, the ME. Um, so I think anybody that's coming through the service, we have had a couple of people that have come with fatigue as their predominant symptom. They have had their needs met really well with the, um, the chronic fatigue, the post viral fatigue pathway that already exists. But people with that more complex collection of symptoms, that's when we go with the, um, the different separate rehabilitation pathways. I'm, I'm just going to bring in another question, Chris, at the same time, because it's along the same lines. And just to ask as well, uh, Chris, if you could explain what CFS and ME stand for. Is that all right? Just for anyone yes. on the call, perhaps, who doesn't know. But Louise has said, how would you look at CFS and ME compared to long COVID? That if somebody had CFS and it, it doesn't help them to manage the long COVID well, mm -hmm. Yes, well, I'll, I'll make a start and then hand over to Becky, who's actually seeing these patients. So CFS stands for chronic fatigue syndrome and ME stands for myalgic encephalopathy. I'm wondering how you're going to sign that, Simon. <laughs> um, so those and their their conditions they're very they're very similar to each other and they're conditions where people do feel very tired and very fatigued for a long time. Now there are similarities between those and the fatigue that comes with long COVID, but as as our colleague is saying here, some of the things that help the fatigue from chronic fatigue syndrome don't always help in long COVID. Uh, so I'll hand over to Becky. Are there, I don't know whether you've come across any situations where they've had to try different things in, the, in that clinic or whether it's too early to say yet. I'd say probably from a therapist's point of view, we're still in the very early stages, but I would definitely say that um, the, what, something that we are doing is we have um, one of the rehabilitation consultants um, from um, Burton Hospital who's really kind of giving us some input into the uh, medical um, team meeting. So when we have somebody with particularly troublesome um, fatigue or where we're not sure they've got some other symptoms, would the um, chronic fatigue ME pathway be the correct pathway for them or should we be doing something else? We've got her expertise to lean on and she, she's she been inputting into how we do the assessments and um, what kind of therapies we we're looking to try and offer so we are getting that specialist input because certainly you know I have a GP background I can do the the holistic initial assessment but I don't have all of the specialist knowledge as an individual and that's why we've got the specialist medical 
um, consultants that are providing their input and, um, and helping to shape the service. From a therapist's point of view, that's still being developed and that's still being kind of set out and, and laid out. So I'd say watch this space from a what therapies start to develop because we what we didn't want to do was to set up a therapy service without actually having assessed people and knowing what their needs actually are. So we're doing it the way around of doing the assessments first and then creating and, and adapting the therapy pathways as we go so that we actually know what people need and we're creating the things that people need rather than the things that we think they need because um, those two those, those two things can be very different. Thank you. Miriam, I know two people have put the hand up. Do you do you want to just ask identify who they are and Yeah, of course. Yeah. If if we can go to Marie um I'm so sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. Marino first, if you'd like to unmute yourself, and then we're gonna to go to Sarah Tupling second to ask her question. Thank you. Yes, hello, it's Mariano. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you for for, for uh, allowing me to to ask a question. It, but, <clears throat> I'm, I've come in on, on this because I'm very interested in the issues with regards to long-term health conditions. It's not completely related to, uh, to long COVID, but I, I have um, angina, heart disease, and um, I'm borderline diabetic. Um, I've been desperately trying to uh, not get not become diabetic uh, have diabetes and now I've, I've been attending a, a program that was referred to by my gp now this program has been going on for a number of months but is now uh, I, I attended the last program um last monday uh and the, the it's been very very informative it's helped me to understand uh, my condition uh, or potential condition uh, about diabetes, how to uh, a diet, um, um, mindfulness, all sorts of things that we've touched on. And it's been really, really helpful. However, when I asked the presenter the question, well, I have a long-term health condition and I feel that it would be so helpful that if uh, I could be... I, if I could have professional guardianship f for a considerable period of time, so if I if I were to uh, digress and 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 um, yeah, I'm, I am sorry Mark, that we have so many questions about long COVID, which right. is what I'm very happy if you put anything in the chat box. We're very happy to pick that up for you, but there are so many questions about long COVID. I think it would be really unfair uh, for mm. for us to just talk about other things at the moment, if you don't mind. No, but no, but no, I, no. I have understood what you've said, and as as I say, we're very happy to speak with you afterwards. But I'm just now going to move on to the next one, Mir Miriam, if we could, please. Yeah, of course. It's Sarah uh, Tupling who's um, got her hand up at the moment. If Sarah wants to come in. I'll, I'll, it I'll, might be that Sarah might um, use I'll move the on to Anne's question. Is that all right, Mary? I don't know if yeah, you want to put in the chat box. Um, Anne said lots of patients report severe fatigue and tiredness. How do they improve this aspect of long COVID without attending a clinic or visiting the GP? I would say that the Your COVID Recovery website is a very good first port of call for information and self-help. Um, and I think that um, prioritising prioritizing your health and giving yourself time to learn more about it and learn more about what we know at the moment is um, is certainly a really good first step. What we're often advising patients in a, in a general fashion is to is to listen to their to listen to their bodies because a lot of a lot of people are used to trying to get better from illnesses by pushing through a little bit you know you, you, well, I'll just push through my limits and then the next day I'll push a bit more and I'll push a bit more and I'll push a bit more and then it will 
gradually just I'll get better and long COVID doesn't seem to follow that rule so rather than that getting better constantly we do get dips we do get it's much more wavy in terms of a recovery line so if we if you listen to your body if you're if you're feeling fatigued that you do rest and that you look at what did I do so maybe you went for half an hour walk maybe next time do a 15 minute walk and then just try and be that little bit more gentle so it's just that listening to what your body's saying to you with the fatigue hearing its signal and trying to reduce a little bit or do things but maybe just pulling it back a little bit and people are finding that as they adjust that view and they adjust that response to things they were definitely um they're definitely finding that things things improve thank you chris did you want to add anything or are you happy for me to move on to the next one feel free to move on all right, lovely. Thank you. We've we just had. I think it's more of a comment from Jake, but I'll I'll just also said that he he's just saying that he thinks the individual geared response is essential for everyone experiencing it, and it seems unique to what they've found. They felt quite alone during recovery, so they're looking forward to it. And then they've just put aside in about mast cell activation syndrome. It looks like a possible cause. So I'm I'm sure, Jake, that we'll pick that up in the uh, when we look through the questions. And if there is a response to that, we, we will get that to you. Um, we've also had one from Alan saying, do you see the post COVID clinic operating one year from now? And how do you imagine the service might develop or change? Rebecca and Kath, do you two want to take that? I would say I, I definitely see that there will be an ongoing need because of the fact that there, there is still COVID. While there is still COVID, there will unfortunately likely be post-COVID syndrome as well as that. But I'll, I'll hand you over to Kath to talk more about what the system plans are. Thanks, Becky. Um, I suppose it, we just need to think that this was set up and a lot of what's been set up, including the website, has been directly from NHSE. Um, so a lot of the framework um, and the ask to get it up and running in a, in a month um, time frame was all from NHSE. So I suppose in some respects it's a directive um, from above, but that is informed obviously by the cases and how COVID um, pandemic pans out over the next few months and, and year but yes I think it will evolve and develop I think obviously there's a national need for that um, which is great because um, obviously that helps us commission services going forward um, if, if NHSE are, are supportive of that so it is a priority um, in Derbyshire we will be reviewing the service on a regular basis um, as we mentioned earlier about patient feedback but um, and we've got that dialogue ongoing. So, yes, we will continue to um, monitor the service and develop it um, is, is the shorter answer. Thank you. Um, Sarah would like to ask a question. She's going to ask it through Simon, the interpreter. Sarah, oh. got her on. Sarah, would you like to put your camera on so Simon can see you sign I'll, I'll, I'll we'll try and pick that up Simon is that all right in a minute we'll, we'll, we'll ask Miriam to talk to Sarah to see if we can get her camera on uh, I'm just going to take this as the last question because sadly the time is nearly up um, John's asked, do we have any information available about the the load on, I'm assuming, on the health service that long COVID is having on our, oh, it is, yeah, on our care, care services. So I assume other, you know, in terms of delivering other aspects. Kath, I don't know if you want to. I'm not entirely clear of the question. Um, do you mean care services? for patients or the the healthcare workers that work within care services 
Um, and I suppose the quick answer is that, um, like everything with COVID and long COVID, lots of research is, is happening um, behind the scenes. So I think, yes, obviously the impact of COVID on all of us, not just, you know, professionally, whether we work frontline or, or, you know, individually in our own lives, you know, I think this is going to affect us and research and evidence will emerge on that. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. That's lovely, thanks. We're just going to try and go back to Sarah. I think she, does Sarah have a camera on now? Simon, are you able to take her question? I can't see her at the moment. Could I we can only see the main speakers. I can't see anybody else. Is it okay if I ask everyone else to turn their cameras off, including this, the facilitators, just for one moment, and we'll just see if that works. So anyone that's oh, got the cameras Sarah. off, I brilliant. You. I can see Sarah, and I think Simon can see Sarah. I'm so Hi. sorry about that. Thank <laughs> you. Hi, we'll let Sarah, Sarah go ahead and ask her question now. Thank you very much. Right. I mean, thank you. Um, it's been a really interesting morning. Um, why I wanted to join is because I've been thinking about, you know, our deaf community in Derbyshire um, and the information for those, you know, this community. And it's very obviously very interesting information. Obviously, you've got your website and that. Um, but obviously, for people with communication needs, especially for deaf people whose BSL is the first language and English isn't their first language, you know, BSL is their, their primary communication. Um, so if people want to go for consultation or they want to come in and they're not sure, you know, if they've got long COVID. It's, you know, that's where I've come in to try and educate um, and get some information that I can pass on to the sort of deaf community in Derbyshire. Um, but if they come in for sort of, you know, if they come in for counselling, even time goes on and on because they can't get an interpreter. They're waiting for like two weeks or three weeks. You're saying for hearing people, for them, it's going to be so much more because. Um, finding interpreters um, and I feel that the CCG and GPs aren't necessarily aware of counselling and I think organisations like Sign Health and the provisions that they can provide. Um, can, so there's always can, that delay yeah. of information. Um, And also less awareness. So I just really wanted to make the point that, yes, you oh. know, what we're doing at the moment is great. It seems accessible, but it's hearing based and obviously English based. So and not for deaf people, it's maybe not as accessible. Kath or Chris or Rebecca, are, are we able to add anything about that at the moment? I was just thinking how helpful um, it is that Sarah's here and able to raise these issues because we want to make sure that this service is available for everybody in Derbyshire, uh, whatever their way of communication. And I was just thinking how helpful it is to have Microsoft Teams like this and that actually it's lovely to be able to have immediate interpreting for what Sarah's saying via Simon. So, and also not only do we have Microsoft Teams, but lots of practices like my own have a video system called AccuRx, which um, enables us to set up a video call with a patient. For some of my patients who can lip read, actually they only need to speak to me and they can lip read what I'm saying. But for other people, we could presumably get hold of our interpreting services for BSL and make sure that we have a three-way call. You're right, it always adds complexity, but I don't think it's a barrier that would be impossible. And I'm sure that Becky and her team would, would make sure that they got interpreting if you or any of the deaf community in Derbyshire needed our service. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. 
And I guess my, my addition to that would be that I would certainly welcome um, a discussion um, either, either with Sarah or with, um, with, with an, another member of the, the deaf community, just so that we could have a brief conversation about exactly what adaptations we, we may need to, or accommodations we may need to consider that we haven't, because we've certainly got the ability for the video consultations, as um, Chris has said, but I, I certainly think that it would be really welcome to, to have a conversation about any additional measures that might make it um, make access right. even better. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you ever so much. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I, I think there are some more questions and we always pick them up in the chat box. I did just want to say thank you very much to Kath, Chris, uh, Chris and Rebecca. Um, as you can imagine, the speed at which this service has been introduced, they are very busy, so it was very good of them to, to take the time out and come today. Um, Kath, I, I think you've, we've already discussed that you might quite like to come back in a couple of months or three months when things have moved on. I, just to update anybody who, who is interested, I don't know if you just want to very briefly touch on that. Yeah, no, thank you for, for all attending. It's, it has been a really good and useful session and I think we'll certainly take a, a lot away, particularly Sarah's points, which, you know, I... I I haven't commented on, but uh, I think there's a lot that, that we can take away. So I'm really keen that we keep this dialogue going. But from my perspective, from the CCG, it'd be great to, to use this, not just for this service, but lots of services. And I think um, certainly COVID has given the opportunity to look at how we develop and deliver services different. And I think, you know, Sarah's points particularly valid on that. So uh, I think, you know, I'm keen that we continue that dialogue. And I think this in particular is a great forum for that. So, yeah, thank you for all attending. Thank you. So uh, for everybody who's on, if, if, if you did want to come to the next one, our next session is planned care, which is basically anything that's not an emergency. So coming to outpatients, having a routine operation. So they'll be covering things like some of the virtual appointments that, that we're now doing. So the way things have changed and what it might look like going forward, that will be on the 31st of March and it will be from 11 o'clock until 12 o'clock so thank you again and I'm terribly sorry I forgot to thank you as well Simon so thank you thank You're you welcome. very much thank for you. that and thank you very much everybody as I say we pick up everything in the chat box so I'm so sorry if we didn't get to your question now uh, I, I can promise that everything will be on our website and all the questions will be answered so thank you again and we look forward to seeing you all soon Thank you very much. Bye-bye.